Welcome everyone to an exclusive interview with Rob Scheiger, whose new novel, The Ubiquitous They, has been chosen for our series of contemporary authors who are breaking new ground in the literary scene. Rob will be interviewed by Alex Idavoy, an active member of the Cuban Cultural Center of New York's literature program. Alex is professor of Spanish at Brookdale Community College in Lincroft, New Jersey. He holds a master's degree from Middlebury College in Vermont and is now pursuing his doctorate of letters in writing at Drew University. Please join me in welcoming Alex Idavoy and Rob Scheige. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our um, the Cuban Cultural Center's ongoing um, contemporary writer series. Today, we're um, interviewing Robert Scheig on his second, third novel, excuse me, The Ubiquitous Day. And before we get into what I think is going to be a very engrossing conversation about his science fiction novel, I'd like to thank Center for coordinating this and doing so much to promote Cuban culture. The Ubiquitous Day is Robert's third novel, correct? Yeah. After Benjamin, uh, The High Ones, which uh, we interviewed you, uh, Andrea uh, O'Reilly Herrera interviewed you uh, last time yes. from the Cuban Cultural Center, and now The Ubiquitous Day. The Ubiquitous Day is, um, as he described himself, uh, as Robert described himself during that interview, is um, a science fiction novel that takes place in contemporary United States, as well as in an apocalyptic future, which is only about five years into the future. Uh, told from different um, perspectives in first person, the uh, the narrative goes back and forth in those timelines. Um, and now I'd like to give Robert a chance to uh, talk to us about um, his, his novel. We've had a series of conversations and um, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> All right, what's the book about? All right, well, first, thank you very much again to Herrera and the uh, Cuban Cultural Center for having me. Um, you know, it's very helpful for an independent author like myself to, to have this kind of type of support. So thank you very much for them for that. Um, so the it's broken down, the, the ubiquitous day is broken down into two narratives. There's uh, one that takes place called the world before and one that's called the world after and it's before and after an apocalyptic event uh, happens that sort of destroys the earth effectively. So the first narrative follows this, the, the Weyer family after their mother becomes mysteriously paralyzed, um, just completely paralyzed under very mysterious circumstances. And after that event, everybody in the family starts going crazy in their own kind of unique way. So the son starts, uh, stops sleeping and starts possibly hallucinating. The daughter keeps disappearing for days on end and no one knows where she's been or what she's been doing or what she's been up to. And all of this corresponds to the appearance of this mysterious man in black named Banner, who he ends up working his way into the Ware home and actually living there with them. So the question soon become, is this man in black some sort of paranormal entity? that's causing all this mayhem? Or is he just a scapegoat who just happens to be witnessing a destructive process at a, at a, at a, pivot, at a pivotal time? So that's the, the first narrative arc, if you will. And then the post-apocalyptic arc takes place in this world where the everything that, as we know it, has been destroyed. The sun, the moon, the sun is expanding and disintegrating sort of before your eyes. The moon's orbit has been thrown off kilt. The earth is trembling and burning. There's all this geophysical violence happening. There's absolute devastation in the world and society has come to an end. There's very few people that even survived whatever this event was. And again, we see Sarah Ware, the, the mother from the previous arc, and she's become a prisoner of this monstrous man named Corson. And he's with his band of acolytes and she's sort of been taken along with them. They're pursuing something that Corson calls the Vermilion. And nobody knows what the Vermilion is, other than we know it means red in real life, but no one knows what the Vermilion is, but they're chasing it and he's hell bent on finding it. 
And anytime they divert from this path, this piercing sound batters their minds and it sort of forces them forward towards whatever this destination is. And as they are going on this journey, you know, there's this sort of inferno sort of chasing them and and following them and sort of pushing them into this one direction. And that's what the that's what the book's about. So I don't I don't want to spoil anything obviously but these these seem like two totally disparate and separate ideas separate stories but hopefully if i executed it well the uh the two storylines will kind of merge into a, a cohesive single i guess story your main character is sarah right and um she's doing work with irrational numbers and she's really the uh the person of interest and most of the story is told from her from her pro point of view um can you talk about irrational numbers and what she's trying to do? And so with irrational numbers, it, it it really talks about one of the themes of the book, which is epistemology, which is the the study of knowledge. And in the case of the ubiquitous day, it's really talking about the limitations of knowledge, at least from the perspective of human limitations. So I've always had a thought that there's something out there, some layer of reality that is sort of hidden in plain sight. It's just something that humans can't see, not necessarily physically see, but just can't comprehend. And this is a limitation that's inherent in being human. It's just like a turtle, if you tried to explain it, what explain to it what language was, it wouldn't ever be able to understand it because it, it lacks the physiological structures in its brain to enable it to do so. You're gonna to try to explain it all you want, you're never gonna get there. It just physically can't do it. Likewise, I think it's sort of egocentric to think that the human mind has evolved to a point where we can understand everything if we just sort of work at it and, and you know keep we're doing the math and keep doing experiments and science or whatever. There's probably a limitation to human intellect, which is driven by physical limitations that we have in our in our brains. So if you look at what's our best way to describe nature, you can sort of break down science to from, from sort of more complex to more fundamental levels. You can go from ecology to biology to chemistry to physics. And then at the bottom of the pyramid, the foundation of it all is going to be math. And you can't get any more basic than that, really, as far as we know. And yet we know math is not a perfect description of nature. Right. Because you have these things called irrational numbers, which are numbers that the they just don't ever calculate perfectly. You can calculate the rational number until the end of time. But the numbers past the decimal point just keep going on and on and on forever. There's never an end and it never falls into any pattern. Right. Like three, one divided by three will be three point three three three. And it goes on forever, but it goes on forever in a pattern. A number like pi, which is pardon the, the pun, but it's ubiquitous in nature, it it never repeats. You can calculate it to the end of time and you're never going to be able to define its value with absolute precision because it goes on and on. And we see the number pi show up all around us in nature, everywhere we look, all sorts of equations and all sorts of you know, math and technology and science relies on this number. And they, they approximate it, but... At some point, if you're like calculating the trajectory of a, I don't know, a spaceship or whatever, if it's going far enough, sooner or later, you're going to have to use an irrational number for the calculation, which means you're never going to be able to calculate it with perfect precision. I think it's a fundamental limitation of the best tool that we have to describe nature. So that's, to answer your question specifically, Sarah's working on finding sort of the, the true nature of these irrational numbers and whether or not they represent an objective reality. And her work, depending on your interpretation of the book, may attract the attention of some sort of dangerous entities that didn't want humans to uh, access this sort of forbidden knowledge, which would have been like the next rung of the ladder. Now, two quotes come to mind when we, we talk about this that, that um, uh, I think relate to, I guess, this concept. The first, uh, bo both of these quotes are from, a, uh, from books I've read by Brian Greene. He's a physicist. He's a string theorist. Um, the, the first 
quote, and I'm paraphrasing this, but the first quote is that when he comes up with new kinds of math, he often wonders if he discovers it or if he invents it. So in other words, is math just another language invented by humans to describe nature, or is it an actual description of an objective reality, one that's already there, just waiting to be discovered? And I've always thought that's an interesting question. I don't know if we'll ever know the answer to it, but it's an interesting philosophical question, I think. The second quote is that he often wonders that if one day he happened to meet an alien with far more advanced technology than us, technology maybe that we could never dream of in our whatever day to day, would that alien say to them, ah, yes, math, we tried that before. Now let me show you how the world really works. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about is, is there something more fundamental that uh, maybe we just e either don't know or can't know? Let's continue talking about Sarah, right? One of the things I asked you is, is, is she trying, I, the way I phrased it was, right? Is she trying to make the infinite finite? And is that something that is, right? I'll just say that, right? And is that something that that uh, that is a, uh, uh, something that we'll never be able to do as human yeah. beings. Yeah, so the way I would say it is that she's trying to define the undefinable is, is the way that I would say it. So she notes late in the book that irrational numbers are defined by what they are not rather than by what they are. And in the book, she figures out in a brief moment how to move human knowledge to that next rung of the ladder. She sort of figures it out. I know exactly where in the book it, it is. I, I don't spell it out, but but it's it's in there. So, you know, going back to what I said before, this advancement of hers leads to, you know, the the attention, perhaps, depending on your interpretation, of other entities that are out there that are sort of paranormal or non-human in some way. One of the... Uh... Most interesting, one of the most challenging parts of 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 this interview is right is is there's so we've we've had so many expansive conversations right to kind of figure out exactly kind of where we want to go and 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 um, what you're talking about right it gets it it gets into theology it gets into right what were your goals in writing it with respect to the ubiquitous say I, I'd say I had a a goal which is trying to layer in as much humor as possible so my my first two books had basically no humor whatsoever. They were just dark and dark and darker. But um, the, the Ubiquitous Day is also a very dark book. I mean, I, it might be darker than the last two books. I, I guess it depends on your opinion. But yet I, I tried to put in a lot of humor there, especially in the world before. And, and in the case of the Ubiquitous Day, I had it as more character-driven humor. And there's, I think, one character in particular in the book that I, I pulled that off the best with, which is the father, because he's just so outlandish. But um, that's that's another objective I had in the book. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you did a great job at, at, the, at the beginning of the book. I, I felt like I was watching a, a, a almost like a, almost almost a sitcom, right? It, it, I, it, it's like, oh, I could see this uh, on, 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 uh, on TV. And it was it was such a it was so good because it what happened afterwards was so shocking that it 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 it, it, it was that much more dramatic right so you 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 laid you know you you created that levity and then to to contrast it with with you know the the, the apocalypse yeah so I mean it's the you have this sort of dark humor of the first half the second the second half that were the it sort of goes back and forth, but before and after the apocalypse, the after the apocalypse is written in a different tone, right? It's it, it's supposed to be very evocative and and very dramatic, whereas the you know the the world before is supposed to be more like darkly humorous. And you know, to to one one tool which you're you're talking about the the first scene of the book is just called the wedding. That's the first right. chapter of the wedding, and the characters are all at a wedding. They're at the party. It's a seeing crazy them. wedding, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. it's a crazy wedding yeah yeah it's a, it is a crazy wedding for a number of reasons and you just see the wedding happen from the different perspectives of the sort of the five main characters that are followed in in the world before and you know you first of all you really describe what what happens there as sort of the event that catalyzes the rest of the book and also you 
I didn't even plan to do it this way, but you ended up, uh, or rather, I ended up uh, creating or I guess generating character development in that first scene by having it shown from from five different perspectives, right? It's not the exact same thing told five different times, but everyone's sort of taking their own take. Like the one character leaves the room, so you sort of see what happens with them and whatever. But it's uh, uh, th there was no there was originally the the plan was just describe it once, but it, again, you you can outline something, and when you actually actually do it and you write it out it sort of comes out differently sometimes than, than you intended and this was a case of that it's the very first scene of the book so rob the, the 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 book right goes uh has this before and after i was wondering if there's a passage that you could you could share with us that um reflects one of the contemporary characters right that puts us in the present moment as opposed to the apocalyptic future yeah so the i i have an excerpt here from uh the point of view of, of the father richard ware is his name and, um, you know, he's uh, a very boorish and outspoken and offensive character. And he's, yes. <laughs> he's that way. And that's sort of his charm. That's why we love and hate him. But uh, anyway, this is this is uh, something that he says in the book. Just my luck. The day I finally make it big, life decides to hand me a steaming pile of dog shit. Here I was, the happiest man on the planet. I had always known it was just a matter of time. All of those years placing bets, pulling my hair out afterwards while watching the game, listening to Frankie's threats when I couldn't pay, struggling to make ends meet because chance decided to screw me the night before. All the times I'd made the right call only for the referee to blow his or for some jackass to miss a goal he should have made or from sack of shit to drop a fly ball that even an invalid would have caught 99 times out of 100. You have to understand, I'd spent years listening to my wife give me shit about my gaming about flushing money down the toilet or some un other uninspired cliche. My wife, the world's wittiest mathematician. God, I couldn't wait to shove this ticket in her stupid face. <laughs> so that's now, the offensive father. No, it, it's great. You can easily imagine this character. Rob, I'd want to, your, your Sarah is your uh, protagonist. Did you, um, why did you choose to have a female protagonist? So in, in my first book, Benjamin, uh, one of my beta readers correctly criticized that there was a, a lack of female characters in the book who had any agency to them. Um, they were all just sort of plot devices, if you will. So I, I tried to correct that in my next book, The High Ones, which uh, featured two protagonists, really, one of which was female. And then uh, there's an, a, a different character who was female, is arguably the, the most powerful uh, character in the book. And, um, you know, I, I felt that was something interesting to do, and I wanted to continue this trend in the ubiquitous day. So in the ubiquitous day, there's, there's a number of female characters in sort of the, the current world before the apocalypse. But the main protagonist in the first part, I'd say, is actually male, that character being Kevin, for those who've read the book. Uh, but in the world after the post-apocalyptic part, the only POV character is, is a female, and that's Sarah. Right. And, and I, I would argue that because the world that she lives in is so brutal and characters are sort of constantly facing these kill or be killed, you know, type of uh, situations and they're in that type of environment, the protagonist, while female, I think is kind of written in a, a more masculine way. And I say this because the whole survivalist mentality, I think at least stereotypically, is typically associated with more male characteristics. Um, that being said, the character had to be female because uh, of what, in some ways, I guess, catalyzed me to write the book in the first place. So there's there's an author named Jack Ketchum who recently passed away. He's considered a horror or thriller author. He's he's famous for extraordinarily disturbing content in, in his books. Um, he's an excellent writer, but I mean, his, his books are a lot. He once said that a, a good writer has to write from the wound, meaning that the trauma or sadness can be a, a good inspiration for art of any kind. And it'll make the art more authentic. It'll make it more real. So that character, Sarah, in the world before, she's paralyzed and she's bedridden. And this all came from, I think, what, what inspired this. I think this is one of those conscious um, inspirations. It came from memories of my grandmother in her final days, who was actually the, the Cuban grandmother, as, as it turns out. 
Um, she, she passed from cancer and she'd been very sick for many years and she wasn't paralyzed, but you know, the, the memories of, of seeing what she went through and, and the ways that she suffered in her final days, I think really affected me in, in a lot of ways. And it, and trauma might, I might be too strong of a word, maybe not, but it, it certainly affected me. So I think when I was describing Sarah's bedridden state and sort of what she was going through, it wasn't identical to what my grandmother went through by any means, but I think it was inspired by it and sort of the, right. the feeling was the same. And one reader actually told me that, you know, her narrative arc, if you will, was was the most disturbing part of the book. I mean, it, it obviously was not meant to be uplifting. So I guess in this case, writing from the wound, at least for this reader, was was effective. Speaking of not not uh, meant to be, um, what was the word you just said? Uh, pleasant or uh, not uplifting? Uplifting. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see. I wanted to ask you to comment on the cover, and and the uh, the image on the cover, which is which is pretty disturbing <laughs> and dark. Yeah, I mean it. Uh, and all so, the, all the math behind them. Yeah, math, math, and occult symbols was another thing in the yes. book. And, and sort of like sort of deeply layered in there not not on the surface but yeah the uh so the the cover of the book which i guess maybe the little graphic on the screen here but it, it was by uh it was done by an artist robin butchnitz she also did the high ones um she's an extremely talented artist i recommend anyone you know sort of look her up she i she does covers of books that are all sorts of different different types of images you can sort of throw whatever you want at her and then she can execute on it and, and, and she can deliver. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that the, the character on the front is, is Banner, the mysterious man in black. And I, I described him to her and I sent her a number of excerpts from the book that describe him or describe things that he's saying. And I said, that's the feel that I want to go with, with this cover. And you know, I had the idea of having the occult symbols and the mathematical symbols sort of behind them, kind of like in this cloud or sort of around them in this cloud. And, uh, you know, there was there was a number of different drafts and a number of different you know decision points that we had to make before we got to the final form. But it uh, I mean, it it really delivered. And the, the paperback also so we're, the one I just showed is the hardcover. The paperback also has it uh, covered by her. And uh, she was generous enough to let me use both uh, of those covers oh it's a it's a different cover images. it's gonna have a different cover yeah oh but, interesting okay paperback yeah right right, yeah. right. It, it, no, it, it is, it is, it is. On, but okay. it's, it's a different cover I'm, I'm sorry say it again it's gonna have a different cover on it but it's the same character banner that's okay. That. okay oh i see what you're saying right 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 I, what happened was i had these two pictures to to choose from and i couldn't decide so i said uh -huh. hey and I use one for the paperback and say, sure. So, so that's just, that's where we went with it. Okay. No, but he's, he, he, it does capture the, 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 uh, the mysteriousness about him. Right. And we never really know where he comes from and what he wants and, 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 and what his motives are. So yeah. I think it captures yeah. it. Well. And that, that was obviously that was intentional, right? He, for, for him as a character, it's like, what, what is this guy up to? Like, he seems to be up to something, but, and he seems to be up to something that's like epic in scale and in terms of when you sort of listen to what the, the, the things that he's saying. But, you know, he's also very cryptic and, and very mysterious and you never really know. What you he's... never really know what. Yeah. 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 The connections with <laughs> with Castro are strong. <laughs> there you go. Another. another yeah. Oh, right. Sure. Everything's open up to inter uh, open yeah. to interpretation. So. All right. The mysterious force. Controlling it all in a very Kafka-esque way. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. And the, and I think I think that the whole theme of of the lack of control is what's it's 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 this constant. It's it's what's so disturbing about it. This yeah. never knowing what's 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 next and 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 what you might be prey to, right? Um, that's that's the uh, yeah that that's the constant tension. Yeah. Uh, that you feel, and also the the. Um, there's a lot of math. There's a lot of you talked about interest in math and a reference to to uh, a cult. Um, I don't know if you have a passage you could share with us. I have a, a passage. Uh, I think 
the best passage here to use would be one about Matthew. Cult stuff is really sort of deeply embedded in the book. I don't know if anything would, would come out really when, um, in, in, a, in a single quote. I think the math stuff, though, it, it does have that. So um, one character says, your existence is, very, is so improbable, it's hard to believe you're here. The sequence of events that led to this moment could have happened in infinite variations, and all but one would have come to a different result. Yet here you stand before me. So the character he's speaking to is, is ruminating on this. And she says, he was right about one thing. The events leading to this moment could have happened in infinite ways. A reality guided by uncertainty. The very feature of irrational numbers I'd always found so dear. Digits sweeping past the desk at one point randomly, flashing into existence eternally, as if the numbers themselves had agency in their expression. Hmm. I had once believed such numbers would prove mathematics represented an objective reality, <clears throat> a universe of chaos and unpredictability and choice. But looking back on the days before the grounds fell, the days of my inexplicable paralysis and the sudden madness of my family made me feel as if some unseen force had been guiding me or steering us or perhaps controlling everything. And now as we travel the desolation, that mysterious usher had once again manifested, this time forcing me towards some unknown destination. There was no choice. Perhaps there never was. Excellent. So, but it's a, it's a, it's drop quotable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. One of the things I I I, um, I shared with you is that I don't know if this resonated with you, right? But this idea right away, I thought in terms of, you know, the whole the whole Cuban Revolution, this idea that people were doing such kind of normal things, and you know. I mean, it was very easy to 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 imagine a a, a a a family wedding, and then this catastrophic thing happened, and all of a sudden, people are in a world that they don't understand. They're in a new land, and everything is right. So, you know, I I, I kind of get the question is right. How, you know, uh, does that resonate with you? Would you think of that or? Yeah. So I think, yeah. So I guess the the question is sort of like how you know, does, does your cultural background influence the work and how does it influence your work? And I think, you know, there's, there's two types of influences, right? There's, there's the conscious influence. Exactly. And then there's the subconscious influence, right? So consciously, you know, I know that the math and the physics books that I've read, and there's actually a lot of geology in the book too, as it, just because right. I was reading a geology, I was reading a geology book at, at the time. And so I started integrating this stuff in there. And that, that's sort of an obvious conscious, uh, I guess, influence, if you will. Then, then you have this, the subconscious influence, which I think is is harder to, to pinpoint, but perhaps is more interesting because of that. So I, I look at it like if you try to figure out what are your subconscious influences, it's it's a lot like interpreting dreams where you can gain more, learn more from the interpretation of the dream than from the dream itself. And I, I, I think that's, that's, that's true. So what, what could have influenced it, right? And, you know, as you said, the characters in, in the book are going on with their lives, they're doing their thing, when all of a sudden, boom, something happens and the world, you know, is turned upside down. It's the apocalypse and those who survived, uh, you know, they, they have their lives shattered, they have to begin again with nothing and, and whatnot. So, my cultural background, being both Cuban and Jewish, exactly, yes, has has a history of that uh, from uh, you know I guess from both sides. On on the Cuban side, we I'm sure everyone on this is going to be aware of uh, this guy called Castro and what happened in the mid 20th century there, and um, obviously the the world changing and and having to be to begin again from from nothing has been part of the the Jewish experience for for millennia all over the world at, at different times, so. Did did any of that influence the work? I mean, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think it probably did, but it, it was probably more at a subconscious level than than anything else. Um, you know, near the end of the book, uh, a character comes across a, a mound of dead bodies that uh, that character describes as being the height of a building. And you know, when uh, when my mother read that, she immediately thought of the Holocaust, right? And concentration camps and whatnot. And I can I could see why that visual would spark that thought you know it was that image that i sort of just generated from my head was that influenced by watching 
Schindler's List as a as a kid? Yeah, maybe, maybe no. not. I don't know, but I think it's it's a it's a reasonable thing to wonder. Right. Yeah, and it gets into the whole the whole discussion of epigenetics and and kind of um, how traumas are 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 handed down from generation to generation genetically. Yeah. And then I was going to ask you if you could share um, something that kind of captures the um, the apocalyptic world. There were a lot of pa great passages of kind of uh, apocalyptic landscape. So uh, yeah, here's here's uh, I debated which quote to go with, but I decided to go with one that uh, is following the destruction happen in real time. The land continues to heave as I make my way to the hospital, sometimes tremors, sometimes full-blown quakes. Many times I fall. Other times I throw myself on the ground, hands over my ears to weather the earth's stentorian rage. I stand, carry on. Dust and ash fill the skies, the wind a maelstrom that strengthens, stills, then surges once again. The ground booms and grinds like the ravings of a demented drummer. Torrents of bedrock rise in every direction, bodies and buildings thrown in the air as if by a tornado. A crevasse opens before my eyes and I leap to avoid being consumed by the very terrain I walk upon. A volcano erupts somewhere on the horizon where no seismic activity has never been seen. Pillars of carbon, of carbon dioxide and steam shoot skyward at this, as if belted from the flu of some tantruming super earth. Scoria rains down in cataracts of fire and flame. A massif reveals itself in the distance where no mountain range should be. Every point of reference is gone. It's terrorizing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it's apocalyptic, right? It really captures kind yeah. of the, 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 the sense of, of, of hopelessness that, that one would, would experience. Right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think I think right those those um those quotes give us a, a sense of of the, the, the dimensions of of this book. Someone wants to pick up a copy of Ubiquitous Day. Yeah, I mean you can you can buy it anywhere online. Um, BarnesandNoble.com has it. Amazon has it, obviously, and most online bookstores have it. You, generally, if you search for my last name, S C H E I G E, that'll be a quicker way to search for it. It's also available at Politics and Prose here in Washington D.C. If you happen to live in the area, you can go down there. There's there's books in the store there as well. Excellent. Yes. Um, I think we could go another 45 minutes, but I think it's time to, to, uh, to bring this to a close. So I'd like to thank you so much for, um, for having us, uh, giving us this chance to interview you on, on your third novel, anything kind of in the works? Not, not right now. Um, I, I have an idea in my head of a book that I want to write. Um, it's, it would be a, uh, more of a fantasy novel but uh but sort of based on some some real world events which is sort of guide the overall story arc you know I, i'm not sure when i'm gonna have the opportunity to write that because you know we have a uh a one-year-old now and which which came you know sort of after basically around the time that i published this book actually but uh, he's sort of dominating my free time so it'll happen eventually but probably not anytime in the immediate future just because just the, the amount of free time that I have to write in is 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 limited, if if and if it exists at all, I'd say. He's uh, if you were to write a book about him, it'd probably be the ubiquitous he. <laughs> yeah, it will, it'll be yeah, dominates it'll, everything. <laughs> it'll be called it will be called the, the ubiquitous diaper change. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. This has been great, and um, thank you so much, and thank you uh, for for uh, all your work. All right, Nick, thank, thank you, Cuban Cultural Center, and then thank you for, for taking the time to read it and, and think about it and come up with all these great questions. Yes, and, it was great. It was great having the conversations with you about the book. Yeah, thank all you. Right. I'd now like to invite you all to a Q&A that Robert's going to offer us. There is a link to uh, in the chat section. Please join us um, for a Q&A if you have comments, questions, or just want to listen. Um, Please join us. Thank you so much.